Stetson University students. To earn cultural credit for this event, listen to the presentation and take the online quiz. A score of 70% or higher will earn cultural credit. The library will report the credit to the registrar's office. I'm Sue Ryan, Dean of the DuPont Ball Library, and I will be narrating this presentation, which is based on material from our library archives and other sources. Max Cleland is one of Stetson's most well-known and most beloved alumni. This presentation will just be a brief outline of his long career in public service, which started in the military and included years of government service. The Stetson University Archives, located in the DuPont Ball Library, is the home of the Max Cleland Collection. Thousands of photos and memorabilia items document Max's life and career. Born in 1942, Max was the only child of Hugh and Juanita Cleland, and he was raised in the small southern town of Lithonia, Georgia. Max describes his childhood as happy and relatively normal. He played high school basketball and tennis and was named outstanding senior at Lithonia High School. During a vacation in Florida, Max discovered Stetson University and decided that he wanted to be a Stetson Hatter. Max arrived at Stetson in the fall of 1960 with dreams of a space age teaching career in physics. In his own words, he describes his Stetson experience. But when I went to Stetson, I was a pine knot man. There's no question about that. Whether I've turned into something or not is for other people to judge. See, initially I thought I was gonna be a teacher, a physics teacher, but I didn't have enough math to get even in basic physics class. So uh, later I thought I was gonna be an English teacher. Well, <laughs> it kind of died with uh, medium English, but um, I realized that, uh, that, that I'm teaching wasn't gonna be my bag, it was gonna be serving. That call to service led Cleland to join ROTC and to seek opportunity to spend a semester in Washington, D.C. Then it turned, turned my life around. That was the time, the fall of 1963, when President Kennedy was assassinated. And we were invited into the Oval Office to see the Oval Office. I was one of the last people to ever see the Oval Office under President Kennedy. I saw the, the rocking chair and the desk. 72 hours later, the president was assassinated in Dallas. While Max may have had a bit of a rough start academically at Stetson, he found his footing and embraced his college years. During his four years at Stetson, Max not only joined ROTC, but he was a member of the Lambda Chi Alpha fraternity. He loved his time on campus, making lifelong friendships with some of his professors. By senior year, though, he was restless and bored in what he and others called Deadland. Inspired by President Kennedy, Max applied for and was selected as a Stetson student to participate in the Washington semester in DC. At American University, Max took classes in politics and government and caught what he called Potomac fever. Max was still in Washington when President Kennedy was assassinated, and he went to Arlington Cemetery to watch the president be interred. Both the death of President Kennedy and his Washington semester experience had a profound effect on Max. He confirmed his commitment to join the military and engage in a life of some type of public service. In this photo, you see him many years later with the Washington semester students. Max graduated from Stetson in May 1964 and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. He is seen here at graduation weekend with his parents. Before going on active duty with the Army, Max enrolled in Emory University in Atlanta to work on a master's degree. During that time, he spent the summer in Washington, D.C. as an intern to Congressman James Mackey, and he met one of Georgia's most famed politicians, Senator Dick Russell. Max could not imagine at the time that more than 30 years later, he would win the same Senate seat held by Dick Russell for almost four decades. After attending Emory University, Max became an active duty army officer in the fall of 1965, serving as a signal officer and as an aide to General Tom Rienzi for the first two years of his military career. Although Max could have stayed on with General Rienzi, he decided in 1967 to volunteer for service in Vietnam. 
a decision that would change his life in ways that he never imagined. As a signal officer with the Army's 1st Air Cavalry Division, Max participated in every major operation by the cavalry in 1967, though much of his year-long tour in Vietnam was relatively uneventful in his words. In our archives collection, we have a very powerful set of tapes that Max recorded during his year in Vietnam. And as the tapes progress, you can hear Max coming to terms with the war and growing up very quickly as the reality of the situation set in. Listen to his own words. I'm gradually begin to, beginning to feel like uh, an old veteran because uh, it only takes about one mortar attack uh, and you, you grow up pretty fast. Uh, I'm sure that in the next two to three weeks, we're going to have our share of action. And uh, the moment of truth, as Hemingway says, will be nigh. I, I'm afraid I can't offer any kind of neat, bad solution to the situation over here. Everybody I talk to, uh, they say they'd run for president if they had the solution, but uh, unfortunately they don't. It looks more and more like it's uh, just uh, like it's past the time for solution. I think the time for the solution of the problem was actually back before it started. We can't go back uh, to pre-colonial days. We can't go back to the 50s where there might then have been a chance of actual uh, solution. It looks now that too much has been uh, bet on a, on a very nasty game that now all of a sudden nobody wants to play. And uh, like all wars, uh, it's just going to end up being uh, a test of power between the two uh, participating parties. In the bottom of one of hundreds of boxes that have been stored for decades in his parents' basement and later given to the library was this small book titled Case on Diary. When we first showed it to Max, he had forgotten that it had existed and he saw the contents for the first time in 40 years. Like the tapes, the diary chronicles Max's time in Vietnam. On September 29th, 1967, he wrote, got first word on the move north, was elated at first. Gradually, it began to dawn on me how really ill-prepared we were. Still, I relished the thought of advancing northward to where the action was. Six months later, Max writes that his unit was going to reinforce Quezon. Quezon would turn out to be a major battle of the Vietnam War. And Max seems to realize that they may be in for a tough battle that will be heavily dependent on both air power and the weather. He said, the enemy is in a good position to provoke us to reinforce Khe Sanh, then hit the rear as well as everywhere else in Vietnam. Max goes on to say that they probably should never have attempted to defend Khe Sanh, and he is clearly worried about getting back home. He wrote, maybe we will be lucky. If I ever make it back home, I don't think I'll leave it again doesn't look too good for that now. I was scared out of my mind at first, but the will to survive has taken over now in a quiet way. The belief that I will make it some way. I do hope to hell that they either bring us back or help us out. We can't hack it by ourselves for long. Something has to give. On April 2nd, only weeks before he was scheduled to go home and end his time in Vietnam, Max was part of the relief force that helped secure 5,000 isolated Marines at Khe Sanh. On April 4th, Max and his unit were pinned down in a bomb crater near the Khe Sanh base and came under rocket attack. At daylight, four of the men in the battalion were dead. Just four days later, 200 men in the division were dead and Max's life would soon change forever. On April 8, 1968, Max stepped out of a helicopter to set up his position east of Quezon. He reached down to pick up a grenade that he believed he had dropped and it exploded. Max was severely wounded and barely alive. The watch he was wearing at the time is frozen at the time of the explosion 
and the watch hands were bent by the blast. Max's parents began receiving telegrams about his injuries and his whereabouts. On April 17th, they were told that although he was seriously ill, he was not in imminent danger of dying. On April 25th, Max's parents were notified by telegram that both of his legs would be amputated above the knee and that his right arm would be amputated below the elbow. And that despite his good general health, his prognosis was guarded. They next received notification that Max would soon be sent to Walter Reed Hospital in DC. Max would spend a year at the snake pit at Walter Reed. That's the nickname for the unit in which he lived. While he was surrounded by other soldiers who had various degrees of injur injuries, none of them received psychological counseling. From Walter Reed, Max moved to a nearby VA hospital to engage in extensive rehabilitation and physical therapy. He fought for a long time for prosthetic legs, but doctors told him that he was not a good candidate for the prosthetics because of his above the knee amputations. Eventually, Max won the battle and began to learn to walk with the very heavy legs and metal crutches. In December 1969, a year and a half after he was wounded, Max returned home to a hero's welcome in his hometown of Lithonia. While he was glad to be home, he did not know what the future held for him. Listen to his own words as Max talks about his prospects and is about his decision to enter politics. I was spent a year and a half in military at the PA hospital. Came home and wondered what in the world I was gonna do. So I said, well, I took a stock in my life. I said, no job, no future, no girlfriend, no money, no car. Now's a great time to run for the state senate. So, so that's what I did. And believe it or not, won 1970. It was the same year I was 28. I was youngest member of the elected, elected to the state senate. And a young man by the name of Jimmy Carter uh, had won the race for governor and Carter got sworn in and I got sworn in to state government at the same time. Max gained a considerable amount of freedom when his car was outfitted with hand controls, allowing him to drive. He campaigned for the state Senate on his prosthetic legs, which were very difficult to use, and left him bruised and exhausted at the end of each day. Seen here, Max's artificial legs were very heavy with none of the modern advancements we see in prosthetics today. The prosthetics are in the library today and are a reminder of the burden that Max carried in that first election. Max would go on to win a second term in the Senate, a rare feat for a Democrat in a Republican controlled Georgia district. During his first run for state Senate, Max met Jimmy Carter, who was then running for governor. Although Max liked Carter, he never imagined that a farmer could win the governorship. While both Max and Jimmy Carter won their races, they began a lifetime friendship. During Max's time in the Georgia Senate, he introduced a bill that all buildings built with public money in Georgia must be handicapped accessible. This was well before we had national legislation like the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Max was honored to have Governor Jimmy Carter sign it into law in 1972. Max ran successfully for a second term, but this time he ran using a wheelchair instead of his prosthetic legs. It was a difficult decision for Max to move to the wheelchair as he worried that people would not vote for someone in a chair, but the legs were very painful and tiring, so Max stopped using them from that time on. After two terms in Georgia's Senate, Max decided to run for Lieutenant Governor. He lost that race, but was soon invited by California Senator Alan Cranston to work in his office, reporting to the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs on the condition of VA hospitals. So Max packed up his few belongings and moved to Washington, DC to earn a whopping $1,200, $12,500 a year as a Senate staffer. Although the Vietnam War had been slowly winding down, the war finally ended when Max was in Washington. Max had come to believe that the war was meaningless. 
When he gave all of his Vietnam memorabilia, including his medals, to the Stetson Library, he said he wanted nothing more to do with that stuff. In his book, Max said, for me, Vietnam meant loss. Lost legs, lost arm, lost youth, lost innocence, lost war. Those of us who fought were victims of history. When Jimmy Carter was elected president in 1976, one of his first appointments was his friend Max Cleland as head of the Veterans Administration. Max would become both the youngest VA, VA head ever, as well as the first Vietnam veteran to head the organization. Max has called this appointment at, as the public service that he most cherished, even though the VA was in terrible condition when he arrived and he found it to be a difficult and thankless job. When Jimmy Carter lost re-election of president, however, Max also lost his job and he headed back to his parents' home in Georgia. He decided he would run for the Georgia Secretary of State, his first statewide election. Max would become the youngest Secretary of State in Georgia history and was elected three times for the position, serving a total of 13 years in the post. As Secretary of State, Max appointed the first Black Assistant Secretary of State, registered 1 million new voters, and had an open door policy for anyone who wanted to meet with him. The position was considered a safe position that Max could have likely kept until his retirement. But Max was restless and wanted a greater challenge. While he was considering a run for Georgia governor, US Senator from Georgia, Sam Nunn, announced that he would not seek reelection and Max decided to run for a seat in the US Senate. He campaigned hard for two years and ended up in a too close to call election night. When he woke up the next morning, Max got the news that he would be one of the two US senators from Georgia. As a Democrat, Max sat on the Democratic side of the Senate near Senators Hillary Clinton and Ted Kennedy, and Max would become close to both of them. He would sometimes go to the Kennedy's family compound in Hyannisport and sail with Ted on the family sailboat. While visiting Stetson to talk about his gift of the Max Cleland collection, Max told stories about the Senate. It was so amazing to go in the Senate. If you go in the Senate, you just sit, sit in history. Um, there's a great chapter uh, in Cairo's book about Lyndon Johnson called Master of the Senate, where he talks about uh, Johnson's relationship with Dick Russell from Georgia. It was really Russell who was the master of the Senate, and Lyndon Johnson became his student. Lyndon went to Dick Russell and said, I want you to be my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. And he began to invite deliberately Russell over, who was a bachelor, over for dinner on the weekends. Because Russell was the classic workaholic. As a matter of fact, Ted Kennedy told me that President Kennedy once wanted to reach Russell uh, one Christmas day. And he said, where do you think he is? He said, well, he's probably in his office working. So the White House calls the office and Russell answers, it's Christmas where Russell's working. So Russell was really the master of the Senate, and I was so honored to take Dick Russell's seat, the Dick Russell, Sam Nunn seat in the Senate. They occupied the Senate, that Senate seat, for 64 years. Both of them rose to become chairman of the Armed Services Committee, and Russell rose to become not only chairman of the Armed Services Committee, chairman of the Appropriations Committee, the president pro tem of the Senate. The last day I saw Dick Russell, 1969, I was wearing my limbs, I was so proud, uh, I went in and I said, and he, says, he says, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm thinking about going back to Georgia and running for offices. He said, I'll never forget. He said, that's good. He said, just remember, uh, take your job seriously, but not yourself. <laughs> in that office was a huge, long table. Later, Joe Biden told me that uh, that table after Dick Russell died went to Stennis. So when Biden came to the Senate, he went in to pay a courtesy call on, on, on Stennis. And so Stennis has this long table. 
And so Sinan says, son, why did you run for the Senate? Died and said, Well, I knew it was active in civil rights. What? And he caught himself. There he's up against the old segregationist. Later, as Senate, Senator Stennis is exiting the Senate, he calls Biden back in. And Stennis sits there and says, Son, said, You know, you were wrong. He said, Every week, the Confederacy sat around that table. He didn't say the senators from the states of the Confederacy. He said the Confederacy sat around that table. And of course, it was Dick Russell who planned the strategy for the filibuster against the Civil Rights Bill, which ultimately in 64, that filibuster was broken. And we had the Civil Rights Bill with Johnson and Humphrey being the challenge. That, that's what that, that got Humphrey the, the vice presidency, actually. And so Stennis says to Biden, son, I want you to have that table. That's the kind of stories you hear around the Senate. So uh, for me to take Dick Russell's seat, Sam Nunn's seat, was the highest honor I could ever hope to achieve. I had the, I got the Dick Russell desk in my office. They pulled it out of archives. But I had um, a seat in the Senate back up. A, I was a backbencher because that's where the freshman senators start. The Senate is organized so that the so that the oldest political party, not the dominant political party at the oldest political party is on the right. And the next oldest is on the left. So that's why the Democrats are on the right, because they're the oldest political party, and the Republicans are on the left as the presiding officer speaks. But the youngest senators sit on the upper right to the presiding officer. That is still where Ted Kennedy sits, because he occupies Jack and Bobby's desk. Ted Kennedy is about number three or four now in seniority. He can occupy any seat in the entire Senate on the Democratic side. He chooses the freshman area. And so I was back there. It was me, Paul Wellstone, Ted Kennedy. <laughs> can you imagine uh, being in that situation for six years? So Ted Kennedy, one of his staff people, when I voted against the Ashcroft nomination for attorney general, a paper in South Georgia lambasted me in a cartoon and basically said, were you just trying, trying to please Ted Kennedy? Well, Ted Kennedy's name as anathema in Georgia, especially South Georgia. But then Ted sees it, writes me a letter and says, I just came across this cartoon, which is from the Tribune in Georgia in Camden County last February. I thought you'd like to have this copy quote, preface, but you don't have to display it anywhere a Republican might see it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so. In the Senate, Max served on a number of committees and earned respect for his work in such areas as health care and education reform, bioterrorism preparedness, homeland security, and fiscal responsibility. In this photo, he is seen with the senators who had all served in the Vietnam War. While in the Senate, Max not only developed a personal relationship with Hillary Clinton, but also with President Bill Clinton. Max had first met Bill when Max was Georgia Secretary of State and Clinton was governor of Arkansas, and they had always liked each other. Max ran for re-election in 2002, but lost to a Republican candidate at a time when it was becoming very difficult for Democrats to be elected in Georgia. The campaign got very ugly at times, which was chronicled by cartoonist Gary Trudeau in his Doonesbury series. Max's seat was targeted by Karl Rove as one that the Republicans would attack particularly hard and the tactics were successful. After the loss of his Senate seat, Max battled depression and renewed PTSD brought on by the war with Iraq. He returned to Walter Reed for treatment, this time for the counseling that he never received in the 1960s. And he got help with his depression, anxiety, and PTSD. At the urging of his longtime Stetson friend, political science professor Wayne Bailey, Max accepted two positions at American University, serving as an adjunct professor to the Washington semester program that had been so influential in his own life as a college student, 
and as a fellow in the American University Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. In 2002, Max was appointed to the National Commission on Terrorist Acts upon the United States. The commission was formed to prepare a full account of the 9-11 attacks. In December 2003, Max resigned from the commission, noting the lack of cooperation from the Bush White House and what he believed to be a compromised investigation. For the next several years, Max served as director of the Export Import Bank of the United States. The bank is the official export credit agency of the United States federal government. It operates as a wholly owned federal government corporation, assisting in financing and facilitating US exports of goods and services. In 2007, Max was semi-retired and was doing speaking engagements and working on a new book. In 2009, however, President Barack Obama appointed Max to be the secretary of the American Battles Monuments Commission. The commission oversees American cemeteries in foreign countries. In this role, Max would sometimes travel with President Obama, such as this trip to France to commemorate the 65th anniversary of D-Day in 2009. The event was held at the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial and included more than 100 World War II veterans. Max would hold this position until the end of Barack Obama's presidency in 2016. Max seems to know everyone, thousands of veterans of many wars, his many friends from Georgia and Washington and Florida, politicians, sports figures, and celebrities from many fields. Here he's seen with just a few famous faces. Our archives is filled with many more photos of Max with people both known and unknown. One of my favorite Max celebrity photos is this one of him singing on stage with the Beach Boys with the message for Max to keep his day job. Max is currently living in Atlanta, Georgia and is today 79 years old. He has always had an amazing memory and is a master storyteller. He's always loved basketball and tennis and all things cowboy and old Westerns. Max is now facing serious health challenges and is cared for by longtime friends. Max has made the best of a difficult life. His suffering and disabilities have made him a role model and an advocate in a way that he did not choose for himself, but he has turned adversity into accomplishment. In his book, Heart of a Patriot, Max said, I found in my own life that I had to exude positive energy into the world in order not to be overwhelmed with sadness and grief over what I have lost. Stetson is proud to have Max as one of our outstanding alumni. <laughs>